Um, hello, everyone. Um, my talk will be in English because my colleagues in the US and in Brazil also want to listen it. So it will be in English. Um, my name is uh, Alex. Uh, I'm living and working in Warsaw right now. Um, I'm a front-end uh, developer and designer. And there's my website and there's my nickname. You can find me over the internet. So uh, this is the company I'm working in uh, since 2011. And recently we were acquired by uh, this company. It's a big corporation called First Data. Uh, they are really huge. Uh, and right now we're developing a big uh, e-commerce project for them. So we're a product company. Uh, but uh, I think we should start with a joke. And it will be a really geeky joke. Uh, I don't expect anyone of you really laughing from this joke, but it does make sense for this talk. So um, two CSS properties walk into a bar, and a bar still in a completely different bar <laughs> falls over. So, OK, some people understand the joke, so it's actually funny. Uh, it's a joke by Thomas, and who knows, Thomas is a member of Rails core team, and he's developer of Script Oculus. This was probably the first uh, JavaScript framework for effects in Rails. It's very old, so this guy really know, knows what he's talking about. Uh, here's a short agenda, what we will talk about. Um, we will talk about CSS methodology, what is CSS methodology, uh, how to use it, what uh, CSS methodologies are out there. Uh, we will talk about functional CSS, of course, because that's the main topic. Uh, and we'll talk about our plan to fix all of our CSS issues using functional CSS. So let's start. Good old CSS. Um, we love writing it. Uh, it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to learn. It's extremely easy to learn. That's why everybody is writing a little bit of CSS. Backend developers, DevOps, frontend developers, designers, probably everybody's writing a little bit of CSS because it's really easy to learn. It's easy to write, but it's damn hard to refactor. And because everybody's actually writing a CSS, uh, there's a lot of messy CSS in project, especially if you're working in a product company where Backend developers, front-end developers, some kind of a full-stack developers, have no idea what's that. Also writing CSS, and it's kind of a messy. So CSS is hard. Uh, the issues why CSS is hard, one of the issues is that uh, everything is in a global scope. Uh, it's almost impossible to uh, write a piece of CSS code that will be working just on a small piece of HTML of your page. So the guys from uh, Google are actually working on this, and you can do it in uh, Shadow DOM, for example, but it's not implemented in all of the browsers, so uh, it's one of the main issues of CSS. The other one is everything is mutable. So you can write some kind of a class, I don't know, class header, and then another developer in another style sheet that attached to your HTML page will also write a class named header, and maybe his class will be more important than your class, and you will have an issue. And those people, usually, they in a big product company, they may not even speak with each other. Like, they may work in other countries, and they're working on different pages, but the same style sheet attached to the same, to the same HTML pages, and you will have an issue with that. And specificity. Uh, specificity is crazy. So developers are always fighting about this, because uh, you can be more specific than another developer. So one front-end developer writes one set of styles, and then another guy that have a, I don't know, maybe he's have a deadline for his feature tomorrow, and he's tried to write a little bit more specific CSS code, and his code will be more important. And it will break your feature, but his feature will be working, and the product team will approve it, and it will go to production and break half of your website. So CSS is hard. It's the same, in the same situation, it's easy, and it's hard. Uh, so what is CSS methodology? Uh, so this is very extremely detailed explanation of what is CSS methodology. I will not read it. You can read it if you like. But uh, I used to say that CSS methodology is just a, a peace of mind for developers. You just have some kind of a guide, structured guide that you follow, and you write all of your code using that guide, and everything is fine by idea. It never works that way. But the idea is that everything will just work if you just follow this magic guide. Uh, you have a lot of uh, already prepared uh, CSS methodologies. So there are tons of them. The most popular are probably SMACs, uh, object-oriented CSS, 
IT, CSS, atomic design is extremely popular right now. But um, all of these guys, they have a, they have a really big um, uh, complex explanation. What is CSS methodology, uh, how to follow this one, what set of rules you have to apply, and uh, you have to teach all of your developers how to use the CCS methodology. So it's very difficult, actually. If you ask anyone how to do, how to write a, a CSS on scale, uh, and you will ask uh, what's the best CSS methodology to use, they will probably suggest you uh, this one, uh, the BAM. Uh, this is a uh, BAM stands for uh, Block Element Modifier, and it was developed in, uh, by Yandex. So it's, uh, it's really good. It's actually really good, and a lot of people are recommending it. And if, you have a, uh, if your dev uh, team of uh, developers are only specifically front-end developers, and they only write like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and they don't do any back-end, they just focused on that, uh, you can use BAM, and everything will be fine. But you will start with BAM, but generally you will end with something like this. It's kind of a Frankenstein of uh, all of the CSS methodologies. And uh, yeah, you can uh, Google this crazy name, the Atomic Object Oriented BAM IT CSS, and you will find a, a big article on the SitePoint website uh, explaining how this thing is actually happening. Because uh, if you're developing, if you're working in a product company and you're developing a lot of user interfaces, and as time goes by, you start using some pieces of another methodology, and you just you just end up with something like this. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, what is functional CSS, and how functional CSS is different from that? The explanation is really, really extremely simple. Uh, it's just a set of classes that represent simple functions that do only one thing. So it's uh, kind of similar uh, to functional programming, where you write pure functions, for example, in Haskell or Erlang, that kind of stuff. So they have to be extremely simple, and uh, they have to be, uh, they don't, have, don't need to have uh, any side effects. That's the main point of uh, functional CSS. Uh, it will look uh, like this. Uh, so this is an, an example of a functional CSS methodology. You will create a set of classes uh, representing, uh, they usually have only one property. So you can choose some kind of a scale for your font size, for example. And you uh, create a classes for each font size and you just apply these classes exactly in the place where you need them. Not like global, in a global scope. No, exactly at the, say, at the exact place in your HTML code. So for example, you don't say that all H1 tags on my application will have this font size. No, you, you have to apply this F1 tag everywhere where you want font size 30 pixels, and etc. So another example is, uh, uh, so this is from one of the functional CSS uh, frameworks. So the name of the class actually means uh, margin vertical on a third scale. And you have margin top and margin bottom. It's extremely simple. It's very easy to explain to other developers. Everybody understands it. And it's really difficult to fuck up with this. It's extremely easy. It's that easy. Everybody understands it. Uh, another example, uh, you can have animations. So basically, with functional CSS, you have the whole CSS uh, written by a set of classes. Like for every possible property, you will have a specific class. And for font sizes, for uh, colors, you will, mm, not colors, but margins, patterns, you will have some kind of a scale and have the numbers. For example, font size one, font size two, margin one, margin two, margin vertical, margin top, that kind of stuff. Uh, so the core concepts of uh, functional programming is, uh, the first one is uh, performance. Uh, everything should be very fast. And uh, performance is critical. Uh, Recently, uh, I visited a very interesting conference uh, in Warsaw. It's called uh, Design, uh, Design Something, I don't remember. But the conference was really good. The main speaker was from, uh, uh, do you know of uh, Smashing Magazine? Smashing Magazine? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh, the main speaker was uh, uh, Vitaly Friedman. Uh, the after, yeah, but he's actually from Belarus. <laughs> yeah, he's from Minsk. 
<laughs> yeah, so, uh, and he described one example that he tried to open a walk website uh, in airports when he was in roaming. And uh, uh, the CSS for the walk website on a mobile was four megabytes. And he paid like um, 60 pounds for uh, roaming cost. And the website didn't load because he ended up, th there was no more traffic, like uh, there was no more money on his account and he didn't open the website. So that's crazy. And your CSS should be as small as possible and as performant as possible. Also performance is important because if you construct like a big set of classes with IDs, with, uh, with tags, uh, that kind of stuff, uh, it took much more computing power for browser to parse those selectors, those rules, and to render it on page. So the paint time will be longer. So the, the simple, simple classes works the best. Uh, clarity. Uh, Clarity is important so uh, all of developers will understand the class names so they don't have to go to the CSS file, they don't have to read the CSS file at all. And the class name should say what it's doing. Uh, and as uh, Brent Jackson said, uh, Brent Jackson is after one of the most popular uh, CSS uh, framework, functional CSS framework. It's called uh, Bus CSS. Does anyone heard about that framework? Bus CSS? No? Okay, so people in React are actively using it. So he said that simple, obvious styles are quicker to internalize, easier to use, and more widely adopted. Um, so I completely agree with that. Uh, the third point is uh, reusability. Uh, functional CSS classes are uh, very easy to reuse. I mean, they, they made for me to be reusable. If you have classes like F1, F2, F3, like you will just reuse them everywhere. Uh, and the last one is uh, immutab immutability. And um, that's, uh, I think that's the most important thing. So when you write this base uh, functional CSS framework, you write all of these classes and pass them to other developers so they will use them. Uh, you have to say that they can't change them and they can't mutate them and they can't override them. They just have to cr create a components combining those classes together. And developers have to find a way how to create a components and I don't know, maybe some kind of a guideline, but they can't just say page home F1 have one size 30 and page user account F1 have size another one. Okay. So, um, Project Atlas. Uh, I call it uh, Project Atlas. This is a, uh, oh, sorry. Um, this is uh, our plan to uh, <laughs> fix all of the uh, CSS issues in our project. So, um, let's talk about it. Um, we have a lot of CSS issues in our project uh, uh, because uh, everybody is, uh, everyone is writing CSS in, in our company, like backend developers, uh, I'm, I'm the only one uh, who writes the front end. I'm the only dedicated front end developer in the uh, whole company. And everybody else is just full stack developers or uh, back end developer only, but they all write CSS. Like they all work with user interface because these days you can't just do back ends. You have to like uh, interact with front end. Uh, because uh, I don't know why, but uh, by my experience, like right now, everybody is, is doing something with front end. They may be writing uh, stuff for React, they may be rendering some server-side React frameworks or that kind of stuff, but most of uh, uh, we have really good developers and they used to be only backend developers, but these days like they all try to, they, they just have to because everything is moving to a front-end. Front-end is more important. Backend is be becoming more and more easier, like there are tons of uh, services like uh, Firebase and that kind of stuff where you have everything several less framework, uh, AWS, Lambda, we have everything ready. So you need to just build a front end for it. So everybody's moving to front end. So yeah, that's me. Okay, we have a tons of inconsistent styles, like different people working on different issues. They have different specs for their features and they all coding a specific uh, front end CSS for their feature. And they may not be even consistent with what other developers is doing and how they are doing. So we have tons of inconsistent styles. We have huge CSS code base. No design system at all. Uh, we have a dedicated designer right now. 
It used to be only me back in the days, but we never have a dedicated designer. But because the speed uh, uh, on how we develop things and how we introduce new features, it's uh, kind of a messy because uh, we have a set of branding styles. We have a, like a class of, uh, we have a colors, fonts, we have sizes for inputs, buttons, and that kind of stuff, but it's very basic. And designer just create uh, PSDs, or right now we're moving to sketch. She creates sketch files. And then she passed those mockups to product team. One product team approves that uh, mockup, it goes to developers. And sometimes uh, in, inside a PSD or inside a sketch file, a uh, designer do some, maybe padding is not 30 pixels, maybe padding is 32 pixels. Uh, but developers don't care, they just open it, they see that this button has 32 pixels, not 30, and, just, and they hard code the new padding. And this happening everywhere, like we have a, about 30 different types of model windows, but it looks exactly the same, but every developer did it a little bit different, like they have a different padding so on the left or different padding on the right. Um, so yeah, that's the issue. Uh, UE is not responsive. Yeah, it's uh, 2016 and we're still not responsive, but we're working on that. Uh, it's terrible, I know. So this brings uh, us uh, tons of CSS related issues. Uh, so I decided to figure out uh, where those issues are actually coming from and how they appear. Uh, there is a special website, it's called testmycss.com. You should go to that website and test your style sheets too. So you may now think that this guy is telling that his company is so bad, the developers are terrible, like the CSS is so messy, they're doing everything completely wrong. Then you come home and then you test your CSS and we'll see how it will look. <laughs> it will be a complete disaster, I tell you. So this is our issues. Uh, I will not talk about every, every issues, but um, we have 30, uh, 341 complex selectors. That's just a huge set of selectors you have in CSS rule. Um, what's the most terrible here? Uh, yeah. Importance, yeah. So, uh, 20 to, uh, more than 200 times people think they are more important than other. <laughs> so, when you have a deadline to, uh, tomorrow and you're working on a feature, you're probably more important than other developers. So, they think, oh, I should use it. And they put that inside, in the end of CSS file that this is more important. This is more, uh, uh, one important is not enough. They try to specify it even more, like they add specificity. So, they have to push the feature out there. It's very important. Yeah, the important. We don't, we don't actually have uh, any uh, IE fixes. We support only IE 11. But I don't know what those things are doing there. And old property stuff, we don't use it. Those are probably coming from, uh, from vendor libraries, like uh, uh, stuff for mo models, like uh, sliders and that kind of stuff. They also have a CSS attached, and those things may be coming from that. Another website called CSS Stats, a uh, really good one. Uh, it shows uh, like um, more details and in a better way than test my CSS. So this is more important. So uh, let's talk about this. Uh, so we have uh, more than, almost 3,000 of rules, uh, more than 4,000 of selectors, uh, more than 7,000 of declaration in CSS, and only 174 properties. Now imagine, you can only create 174 classes and apply those inside the HTML, and that's it. That's, that's everything you need to make those pages work. We don't need 7,000 of declarations. That's too much. Um, other issues like uh, 40 unique colors, 35 unique background colors, and 51 unique font size. <laughs> that's very important. Okay, and we're not responsible, but we have 30 media queries. So yeah, this is terrible. Uh, this is just an example of uh, complex uh, selectors we have, and I was trying to find those things and locate those issues, and I say, oh my God, this guy just freed this huge mass of, uh, this very complex selector just to make line height for this uh, exactly link a little bit more than others. And I go, who is this idiot? And I did a git blame, and it was me. <laughs> uh, when you use uh, things like SAS, stylus, uh, less, and that kind of preprocessors, it's not very obvious uh, that you're writing this kind of a messy code, but this is what your browser see, and 
the browser will have issues with those. And you will have issues with this stuff also. Uh, so um, I was thinking why this stuff is actually happening. And again, we'll really talk about that. It's uh, the main CSS powers and the main CSS issues. So everything just works somehow. Your browser doesn't tell you that you're doing anything wrong. Like you're doing everything like in mockup and it works in a browser, it works in Firefox, it works in Chrome, everything's opening, your product team is ready, everybody's here ready, feature goes to production, like great, it just works. Nobody's telling you that you're doing anything wrong. Uh, you can be more important than others. Uh, yeah, there's tons of ways to do the same thing in CSS. Uh, and developers are very creative about that one. Uh, refactoring is just too fucking scary. So, can you imagine that uh, like you're working in a big company and you have a big CSS file and this CSS file is used by uh, a lot of user interface elements and probably your marketing team was also having few of the uh, like one page websites for something like for signups or for, I don't know, for emails, for clients, some special clients and they use CSS from uh, the main application to get your uh, fonts, to get your colors, to get your font sizes, and that kind of stuff. And imagine you just refactor all of your CSS, and you don't have access to those marketing pages. You just refactor your CSS, and their pages will go down. So uh, on one conference, I don't remember where it was, but uh, the guy from Dropbox uh, was telling exactly that story, that uh, they find that their CSS was very messy, uh, and they just go, we should refactor it. We should make it really good. And they refactor it and everything was perfect. And the page that was generating like a, a 20 or 30% of revenues that was completely separated from the main application was completely broken. And like the, the company management go mad and everybody wake up in the night fixing those issues just because they refactored the CSS. And it's really scary. <sighs> okay. Um, yeah, and developers write and write and write CSS. We're writing more CSS to fix uh, the previous messy CSS. That's how CSS works. If you know what a specificity graph is, it shows you how more specific you're coming from the beginning of the CSS file till the end of the CSS file. And if you test your CSS on CSS stats website, you can see that specificity grows. And everybody's just adding stuff down uh, inside the CSS file just because they write and they fix issues and they fix issues by overriding uh, previous declaration of CSS. So that's, I think that's the main issue. So I was thinking, uh, how can we prevent this last one? So developers will not write any CSS at all. Uh, after a lot of coffee, uh, I come up with a, with a plan. So the plan is very simple. Remove all of our CSS because like, like we know, refactoring is fucking scary. Uh, choose some kind of a base framework, very simple one, just to have a, some kind of a base foundation to build on. Rewrite all HTML, like test everything, and make CSS immutable. So they can write new CSS, they can create new classes, but the, we can't overwrite what is already written. We have to use that. <sighs> That's a very difficult task. Um, so uh, I imagine myself as that cat, like when everything will be ready. Will be completely relaxed. Nothing will be happening. There will be no more issues. So the plan is uh, CS for CSS toolkit. I choose uh, Tachyons. It's a functional CSS uh, framework. It's not a framework. It's more like a toolkit. Probably one of the most popular one. Uh, we will use post CSS instead of SS. Uh, we already migrated to Webpack. We are a Rails application, and before that, we used a Rails asset pipeline, and it was completely a nightmare. So I hate Ra asset pipeline with every piece of my heart. That's the, the worst thing that uh, is actually developed in Rails, in my opinion. And the IPS, uh, an IPS stands as issue preventing system. So I will use uh, two tools. The first one is called Immutable CSS. It's a JavaScript library that you can use it with uh, Gulp, Grunt, Webpack, whatever. It just checks your CSS and tells you inside the uh, Chrome console that you're doing something wrong, that you're overwriting this selector inside this file from this selector inside this file. So it's really good. And style lint is uh, also really good style, uh, also really good uh, linter. Uh, you create a set of rules how people should write CSS. And if they're doing something wrong, 
it just fails. So the Webpack build will fail. You can't build any CSS if you're doing something wrong. So that's how I plan to prevent all of the issues. Uh, so uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the framework, uh, the toolkit. So tachyons. Uh, does anyone know what is tachyon? It's a from theoretical physics. Uh, tachyon is a, a particle that uh, has speed more than speed of light. So it's, it's much faster than, than light. So that's the idea by, behind this toolkit. It's very lightweight, it has only 15 kilobytes uh, exhibit. Uh, it's amazingly greatly documented. The documentation is really good. And the website will be used as a design system for both designer uh, and for developers because uh, it has all of the sizes, all of the paddings, all of the margins, and all of the possible things that you can use in your design. It's really good. Uh, it's responsive. Every, every class inside this uh, uh, toolkit has a dedicated media class. For example, if you have class F1 that has font size, I don't know, one rem, you will also have a F1M, F1L, so the specific uh, classes that touches the specific devices. It's very easy to build a uh, responsive website using Tachyons. Uh, I decided not to uh, give you a lot of code and examples here. You can just go to the website and see how it will work. And it's very easy to customize, and you can talk with the creator of the framework, Adam Morse, uh, in Slack. He's very responsive. So before Tachyons, uh, this is how our process looks before uh, we starting implement, started implementing Tachyons. Uh, so you look at the page, you go to the CSS file, you change something, then you go to the HTML file, then you change something, then you look at the page again, and the circles, circle goes by, goes by, and in the process, somewhere in the process, you usually broke another page that you don't see, and you may not even have access to that page, but you can easily broke it. Uh, with Stachyons, uh, it works a little bit different. Uh, you just uh, look at the page and change the HTML. You just uh, change in the classes. You're adding classes, you're removing classes, you're composing components with classes. You're not editing CSS at all. You might create a small set of CSS modules for your branding colors, uh, uh, for your branding colors, for your fonts, uh, and that kind of stuff, but usually you don't change CSS a lot. And this really works well for uh, many famous companies. Uh, so, for example, Tesla is using it for a dealer website. Even United Kingdom government is using it for uh, chat with the public. Um, all of these companies are also using it. You can, if you go to the uh, segment IO uh, website, you can see the full website is built with it. Mozilla also using it, one of the projects. So many people actually using it. So uh, my plan was approved by, um, I did this presentation and they think that it looks great uh, and they approved my plan and uh, implementation just started. It started on December the 5th. So I'm not sure it will, maybe it will fail like uh, completely. It will be a total disaster. And they will say like, you're an idiot. Like uh, the idea was terrible, but I really hope that it will not fail and it will succeed. Uh, so I'm still working on it and I can't say how to work. Maybe next time I'll be standing here and telling that that was a really stupid idea and you should not use it actually. But you have to try. We're using Tekians, uh, I'm using Tekians on a side project with uh, Volodya Svejuk. We have a side project kind of startup and we're using Tekians there and it seems worked very well, right? Awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, okay, so um, the summary. Uh, mm -hmm. We just started doing this project and from, from Monday I'm going to vacation and I'm leaving this Tekions framework and all of this stuff to backend developers. And until the new year, they have to figure out how to use it and how to compose the component with it. And this, it's kind of an experiment. And uh, on a day one, they actually created a system to create a set of uh, classes, to create a components from a set of classes uh, from a YAML file and load that stuff inside the HTML templates and inside the uh, React templates. So uh, you set the classes only one YAML file and then you can use them in uh, JS in the front end and in the back end too. So this lazy back end developers, for the first thing they developed, they developed system tech to make write code less. And I think this is really a good uh, example. So um, thank you. Um, any questions? Yeah. You said um, you don't have uh, responsive designs right now, but you are going to, to do it in the future. How are you going to do my queries with such conventions? 
Uh, good one. I actually uh, told about it, but maybe not very clear. So every class inside the Takian's uh, framework have a, has a dedicated media query class. So for example, if you has a class uh, margin horizontal one, so it means like margin left 10 pixels, margin right 10 pixels, you have uh, the same class, but for uh, media, uh, for media, medium screen and for large screens, like, and you create uh, you create a compo uh, components with those classes. Uh, so on large screen you can have different margins. On a medium uh, media uh, medium screen you will have uh, small uh, smaller uh, margins and that kind of stuff. You just yeah, it's it's very yeah it's very similar to that. So one note about the Bootstrap is that uh, Bootstrap doesn't work in this situation because Bootstrap is more like a. a created solution already. It has a, a lot of styles there. It didn't work for us. But yeah, it works exactly the same. No, it is possible. Uh, I don't remember the name. Uh, I think uh, for Ruby, uh, the framework is called Spectre or something like that. It's a regression testing framework. So when you change something, uh, it goes through all of your pages and create a screenshots and then compare it from the, with the screenshots from the previous release, for example, and you will see the regression and what has changed. Uh, but uh, we, we, we tried doing tests, but uh, it may work. But I was thinking about how to create the more simple solution, though these errors will not appear at all. So that was the plan. Did I answer the questions? Yeah, yeah probably, but uh, it's uh, pretty different world for me. Okay. <laughs> 